in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. This is Nick Gersio. Um, right now, I'm John, uh, joined by John Pierre um, Abello from Nielsen. And today on uh, Out of Home Office Hours, we're going to be talking about the Internet of Things. And JP will do a presentation um, for us. A, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, all of these webinars are recorded and with JP's permission, uh, which we'll, we will um, confirm with him um, after we're done here. We will have this available on our YouTube um, page, uh, available by request. These will be um, done in a uh, way that the links themselves will be private because these webinars are for members only, but any and all members have access to those. So. All of our other ones will be available um, for you as well. Also, we're going to have some a little bit of time for some questions, so we're going to do that by having everybody enter their questions into the questions box, and I will go ahead and ask JP um, those questions for you. Um, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it off to him. I'm going to just take just a second and give him control of the screen so you can see what's going on with his. And... JP, how are we doing? I'm doing great. Uh, thank good, you for good, having good. me here. No problem, no problem. Anyway, take it away. Can you guys see my screen? I can see it, yes. Okay, great. Well, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, Kim and Nick for having me today. Uh, today's talk is going to be about uh, consumer measurement for the Internet of Things. This is based on a talk I gave at uh, the IoT World last month in Santa Clara. And this means we're going to look at uh, the consumer side of IoT and how to collect user data generated by these devices and potentially use it to extract new value and help grow the industry as a whole. This is a little different than just Hello Home, and this is more about the consumer devices that are typically found in the connected home. However, there are uh, enough parallels, I think, between these two verticals that have uh, similar challenges and opportunities that uh, I think it makes sense to talk about it here. So my name is JP Abello, and I lead the Global Engineering R&D at Nielsen for the Internet of Things and consumer digital devices in general. So that includes things like smart TVs, um, uh, media players, and so on and so forth. Pretty much anything that uh, the consumers use and that can be connected to the Internet um, and that have an IP address. Um, my goal in, at Nielsen uh, in, uh, in R&D is to enable consumer measurement of these connected devices and help develop strategies for the mainstream IoT consumer market. So I am part of the Nielsen for Leadership team, and I'm also active in the standards community. I'm a member of the IoT consortium, the W3C, the ATSC, IAB, the CTA, the Smart TV Alliance, and I'm also serving as a judge in the CES Innovation Awards and in the uh, TV Academy, uh, in the TV Academy Emmy Awards. So today's talk is actually um, also based on an article uh, that will be published in the um, inaugural edition of the Nielsen Journal of Measurements. The first issue is coming out this June, and we publish quarterly. And it's a 12-page article, which I use for both the, um, my IoT World uh, presentation and today's talk. So uh, in a few days, hopefully, this will be on the Nielsen uh, um, website, on the homepage, and you should be able to download the article with a lot more detail. And what, I'm, and what I am just going, um, going to cover today. So as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, the Internet of Things is, is about uh, adding billions of new devices to the Internet. Uh, predictions are that within five to ten years, there may be as many as 25 to 50 billion new devices that will be uh, connected to the Internet that come from categories that were never um, on the Internet before. And this could be adding up, uh, several trillion dollars of value to the global economy. This includes devices uh, of, of, of any type, basically, ranging from uh, smart door locks to smart light bulbs, coffee machines, uh, connected refrigerators, parking meters, traffic lights, health monitors, brain implants, uh, water uh, sensors, asset tags, even shipping, uh, even shipping uh, containers. And uh, the Internet of Things really, when you think of it, can be divided into main, cate sorry, two main categories. 
Um, on one side, you have the industrial Internet of Things, which is uh, really something that has evolved from an older term called M2M, for machine to machine, and which has been around for a couple of decades and connected uh, industrial devices to the Internet for the purpose of collecting um, data and doing things like remote maintenance and, um, and uh, efficiency improvements. So this side has just matured and become uh, IoT and has just adopted more recent, more modern protocols, but it's the same thing as, that's, been, that's been in use for a couple of decades. And uh, the, these devices already pay from themselves and, and, and generate enough cost savings to justify um, the existence in the market is already uh, substantial. And on, the, on the other side, you have the consumer Internet of Things, which is, uh, which is very new. It's, uh, it's, it's all the new um, consumer devices that are starting to become uh, connected to the Internet and uh, that uh, the manufacturers are um, hoping consumers will buy and adopt. And this potentially could have a much even bigger impact than the industrial side because uh, it could, it, these devices have the potential of transforming our everyday lives and change our society as a whole. Unfortunately, according to a um, recent uh, study by Harbor Research, the vast majority of consumers today still have no idea what the Internet of Things is. In fact, for, for many of them, um, it's still the old uh, vision that was set in the 60s by the Jetsons' um, uh, home of the future, where gadgets were everywhere in the house and could do pretty much everything but I still had to be activated by humans with a multitude of buttons. Well, it turns out uh, this future is starting to become reality now, but it's, it's, it's already a lot smarter than this uh, vision from the 60s. These devices uh, can already um, um, uh, work independently. They can communicate with each other. They can share data. And uh, they can effectively augment each other's intelligence through their interactions. This enables them to become autonomous and coordinated, like we're starting to see in the case of, uh, of self-driving cars, for example. And consumers will benefit from this in multiple ways. Uh, according to a study by the McKinsey, McKinsey Global Institute, uh, within 10 years, these devices will cut uh, about 100 hours a year in domestic shores. And we're starting to see that already with some uh, new consumer brands, such as Nest or Smart Things, which have uh, 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 risen in consumer awareness thanks to uh, high-profile acquisitions by Google and Samsung. This is in fact all part of one big um, evolution of the Internet that um, an increasingly a large number of people are calling the third wave. This is a term that was introduced by Steve Case of AOL uh, a couple of years ago. And that's also been used by the Internet of Things Consortium and Goldman Sachs. And it states, basically, that in the first wave of the Internet, uh, which started in the 1990s, um, uh, the goal was really to connect people uh, with each other through uh, low bandwidth services s such as dial-up and, uh, and, and mostly with, with uh, web browsers like Netscape. In the second wave, uh, we saw the rise of uh, broadband services and the, uh, the advent of the mobile app economy. And now in the third wave, uh, which is the IoT, we're having devices, not just people, uh, communicate directly with each other and cooperate and automate uh, many of, uh, of everyday tasks. So what is the impact of all of this on today's consumers? Well, it turns out I am one of those consumers and um, you will see on this picture, this is uh, my house a few weeks ago. I'm in the middle of a, uh, of a major remodel. I've got it my entire place. I've uh, moved walls. I've put all new electrical, all new plumbing, new ceilings, new flooring, new kitchen, and so on and so forth. And I, I was thinking, since I'm going through that much trouble, why not uh, do the smart thing and try to make my house smart? So that meant uh, looking at uh, automating, uh, sorry, uh, installing smart um, versions of uh, every device that runs electricity in my house and try to automate a lot of the house functions. So the first thing I did was to, was to go shopping. And it turns out all of the major retailers from Home Depot to Amazon to Lowe's and many others are pushing the contact pretty hard already with consumers and have some pretty comprehensive websites to help um, 
uh, people uh, shop for these uh, products. And uh, my first surprise was to find out that the prices are of the of the smart versions of these uh, devices are are very high. Take for example a connected um, door lock. It's about 50 times more expensive than a regular um, a deadlock. And uh, the same is true with uh, connected uh, light switches, connected outlets, even uh, connected uh, LED bulbs, which can, which can cost between 10 to 50 times more than the, than the regular version. So connectivity comes at a very high price. And on top of that, if you want these devices to work with each other, uh, you often need uh, what's called a, a, a smart hub or an IoT hub or IoT gateway, which adds another uh, 50 to 150 dollars to the total and it's really required um, to have the devices uh, be able to automate functions with each other. And it turns out I'm not the only one facing the situation. An Accenture study published recently uh, shows that two-thirds of users worldwide think that IoT devices are, are too expensive. And this is only um, made worse by the fact that most of the brands are incompatible with each other. Um, and uh, this is in great part due to the fact that we are uh, in a situation today where uh, there is complete chaos in the various standards being uh, deployed by the various consumer, uh, uh, various consumer manufacturers. In the uh, first wave of the internet, things were simple. The W3C was the main standards um, body and defined the protocols used by all of the web browsers um, and it was based on HTML and HTTP. So you any website could uh, run on any browser and you had only a single platform. In the second wave, we still had um, HTML and, and uh, HTTP, but we saw the rise of two proprietary platforms, iOS and Android, so the beginning of some fragmentation, uh, two proprietary uh, standards effectively, but it was still feasible, it was still possible for consumers to access the same services across all three platforms. You, would, you could still get Facebook, for example, on iOS, Android, or an, on, or on a web browser. And now with uh, the third wave of IoT, unfortunately we have a situation where more than 50 standards are being developed in parallel worldwide and uh, often uh, completely dependently of each other and it, it's creating a, a, an incredible amount of chaos, uh, of chaos and, um, and it's becoming a, uh, a major problem as most of the devices based on these different standards cannot uh, work with each other. To be fair, we've seen already some consolidation happen um, you might not know these names, but um, in the last uh, year and a half or so, the 1M2M has started working with the Austin Alliance, the ZigBee Alliance is starting to work with the Thread Group, and the OIC and UAP and Forum became the Open Connectivity Foundation. But this is just not enough. We would need effectively the city standards to go down to just two or three to have something comparable to what we had in the second wave. And we start, we're still very far away from that. This could easily take another five to ten years. On top of that, because of this fragmentation of the standards, we've seen the rise of proprietary initiatives from um, Apple and Google with HomeKit and Weave and Brillo. These companies have the pockets now trying to recreate the dominance in that space of, um, of what they have in mobile. So there, there's a very real risk that we may, we, we may, we never, we may never get to a truly open standard on the, on the Internet of Things and the industry might end up being dominated by proprietary platforms. And then there is the fact that not all of the problems have been solved yet. Some of the very basic problems um, still have no solutions. For example, this is a picture of batteries. Um, nobody seems to be thinking about the problem of changing batteries in billions of devices in the field once they start to die. Uh, this is going to be a huge problem. Um, if consumers end up having hundreds of devices in their homes, then we mean changing batteries on, on average every day or every other day. And that that's just not going to be manageable. So some uh, solutions to this, this problem in particular are being worked uh, already and uh, it's still in the very early stages. There's a consortium called the N Ocean Alliance which focuses on something called energy harvesting where instead of batteries they use solar, uh, thermal and mechanical energy uh, collected from the environment to power these devices. Uh, I've looked actually online to see if there were any products available to consumers that use that and I could only find one today uh, at Home Depot. It's a self-powered wireless uh, switch that uh, uses the power uh, produced by uh, 
pressing the button to, to send a signal to, to a master switch. And uh, it's, it's eight dollars just for that switch, so it's still way, way too expensive compared to a one dollar uh, uh, wired switch that does the same thing. So it's still much too expensive for the average consumer. And then there is something called the Gardner hype cycle for emerging technologies. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this before, but this is something that Gardner has been publishing for, for a number of years. And about three years ago, the Internet of Things appeared in that curve. So what this curve uh, shows basically is the level of hype or level of uh, inflated expectations uh, in each phase of the evolution of a new technology. So when a new technology is introduced, it's in the innovation trigger phase. Then uh, expectations rise very quickly and you get into a point where you have a peak of inflated expectations. Then the industry starts to mature and you get into this valley of disillusionment. Then products start to uh, um, appear on the market and start to, to become more affordable and work better with each other. And we enter the slope of enlightenment. Eventually we reach the plateau of productivity where the industry is mature and is used by, by everyone. So in the last three years, the Internet of Things has been every year at the peak of inflated expectations, which, which means that there's been a lot of hype and very little products, very little reality behind it. And the Internet of Things is a very broad field. It has many, many verticals. The consumer side of the Internet of Things, arguably the biggest one is the connected home. And that one just appeared in that diagram last year in the innovation trigger phase. So it's still, it's still in the super early stage. And in fact, what is happening is almost everything that can get home is, is, in, is, is really being adopted by enthusiasts and early adopters. And uh, the mainstream market has not really seen these products yet. And we have, we, what we're trying to do today is cross the chasm between the early adopters and the mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, consumers. And as if this wasn't uh, big enough of a problem, uh, uh, already, we've already seen some signs of slowdown uh, uh, in the middle of last year. Argus Insights reported uh, in June of 2015 that the demand and the interest for, connect for connected home products, in fact, has has grown uh, negative towards the, uh, the, second, the second half of the year, which means that uh, even early adopters are starting to uh, to stop buying these products. Um, so um, the market is, is effectively running out of early adopters and not appealing uh, yet to the uh, mainstream consumers. And then to top all of this, there's been an escalation of privacy and security concerns. Accenture uh, reported in a study published late, late last year that 50% of consumers cite privacy and security concerns as top of mind, and two-thirds of them are aware of recent data breaches. This is especially uh, concerning in the IoT space where consumers are completely in the dark about what kind of data is collected about them. And this, this could potentially affect their employment, access to credit, insurance rates, or even create physical risks. For example, if a hacker can um, take control of your uh, door lock, it could get into your house simply um, with a cell phone, which, which is not something most consumers would work on. And this, this unfortunately has uh, this, according to Accenture, caused already 20% of consumers to return their, their, their IT devices after, uh, after buying them because of, uh, of the security risks. So all of this to say that the IoT, IoT value proposition is still much too weak for the mainstream uh, consumers and we need to find uh, solutions to cross that chasm. So how, consumer, how can consumer uh, measurement help with this? Well, it turns out that um, in, all, in all of the previous large consumer markets, starting from radio, starting from radio to TV, to the web, and to mobile, uh, all of these markets have benefited tremendously from market research. Uh, the ability to measure the consumers has led to a better understanding of consumers and has, ena has enabled um, manufacturers to design, to influence the design of future products and services and grow these markets tremendously. A lot of this, in fact almost all of it, has been financed through, uh, has been financed through, uh, through advertising, which has been able to subsidize uh, consumer prices. Uh, this has been true across all of these markets, radio, TV, web and mobile. And this has been done really through what we call consumer segmentation, 
where uh, where consumers have been um, uh, broken down by demographics, geography, interests, and other parameters. So uh, it would seem natural that uh, in the IoT space we could come up with similar segments, and we could create IoT-based segments that are based not just on what people do on the on uh, on their mobile phone or watch on TV or listen on radio, but actually what they do using these uh, these uh, consumer devices that are present in their homes, you know, things uh, like uh, uh, refrigerators, coffee machines, um, vacuum cleaners, uh, wash, um, uh, dishwashers, and so on and so forth. These devices have the potential to provide information about the real-life everyday habits of the consumers. And this could lead to uh, a new IoT-based segmentation. For example, um, if a consumer uh, has a connected coffee machine and a sleep tracker, we could create a, a segment of heavy, of heavy heavy coffee drinkers who sleep just a few hours a night. Or consumers that have a fitness tracker and a, um, and a, a smart blender, we could have a, an IoT-based segment of people who like to exercise and make smoothies right after their workouts. So just like in the other markets, this could lead to, uh, potentially lead to price subsidies that could significantly boost uh, consumer adoption through reduced prices. And this is confirmed, in fact, by a, a study uh, pub, uh, uh, commissioned by the Internet of Things Consortium in November of 2014 that found out that consumers have a surprisingly high tolerance for ads and marketing if it reduces smart home costs. So one thing that all uh, these devices have in, in common is that they generate a lot of data because you have a lot of sensors in them. And in the case of consumer devices, the sensors tend to generate a lot of data that can be tied to individuals. So this is actually personal data. And this is a really, really big deal. This is, this is quite different from the industrial side because, at least according to CNN, we are entering uh, a, a new phase of, uh, of the economy, what we should call the data rush, where information about, about you, personal information, is effectively 21st century gold. And this is also confirmed by Tech Radar, which says that the Internet of Things is really an Internet of Data. And this is something that insurance companies are already starting to leverage. A couple of um, home insurance companies, Liberty Mutual and American Family Insurance, have already launched programs last year with their um, uh, home policies where they um, offer um, their customers a free Nest Protect smoke detector, which costs about $100 retail and a 5% policy discount simply by um, getting permission to read the data from their solid vector. Just knowing that it's on by itself, that piece of data is worth $100 to them plus a 5% policy discount. So we're, start, we're starting to see real value being extracted from data already from these home consumer devices. However, not all types of data will be uh, suitable for this. It has to be the right type of data. And as I mentioned before, the Internet of Things evolved initially from the M2M field, the industrial side, which was really generating a different kind of data, something that's, that we call telemetry data. That is data that is used to uh, produce diagnostics, to facilitate maintenance of products, remote maintenance, and it's typically not shared with third parties. So for example, if you buy um, a dishwasher from Maytag, uh, Maytag is not going to share data with uh, with a Whirlpool, for example, or with third parties. So all that data is, is kept inside each, each company. It's not really um, accessible for, for uh, um, uh, analysis and, um, and, 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 and other purposes. And it's also the wrong type of data. The data we want is very different. It's data that can be used to produce what we call actionable intelligence. And that is data that represents real life, everyday usage events. And that's things like, for example, in the case of a coffee machine, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event that says, my, uh, the coffee, I'm using coffee machine right now, and I'm using it to brew extra dark coffee from a specific brand of, of, um, of coffee, for example. It is not, uh, if it was telemetry, it would tell me the coffee machine is, um, is, is clogged, or the filter um, is, um, needs to be replaced or there is a, um, a software failure somewhere in the machine and we need to, to, to fix it remotely so the consumer just doesn't return it. So what we need really is usage events, not maintenance events. So the challenge is how do we get access to that data? 
you know, how do we do data collection of, of these usage events? Well, unfortunately, the manufacturers have typically not put the data into their uh, software stacks today. This is not something they've, they've put high, very high in the priority list. It's also not something that's been put in the various standards being developed. And um, the initial uh, thought one would have is, well, what if we talk to every single device manufacturer and persuade them to enable uh, usage measurement inside their software stack uh, on a one-to-one -one basis? The problem with that approach is that it doesn't scale. There are hundreds, potentially, it's going to be thousands. It's going to be an a enormous number of different manufacturers making consumer products um, in this space, and there will be multiple versions, many different software updates. It's, it's virtually impossible to guarantee that measurements will be done across the board in a, consistent, in a consistent manner. So another approach could be to uh, work directly with the um, various um, IoT open standards and, uh, and software frameworks being developed as we speak today. And the list is already quite a bit shorter. The two uh, leading candidates today are all joined from the Austin Alliance and, and the other one is IoT VT from the uh, Open uh, Connectivity Cons um, the, the Open uh, the, uh, sorry from the OCF. And these are in the process of um, of creating a, um, an application level framework where devices can communicate with each other and produce data and this, they don't have measurement today so that would be one place to where we could get a, a lot of leverage assuming um, manufacturers up, uh, adopt these standards. Unfortunately there's almost nothing in the market today that's using these frameworks yet so uh, the, the payback from these efforts will be at least a few years away from now. It will not be available today. There is also some legacy standards being used across the industry, the ZigBee Alliance, the Z-Wave Alliance, and the Bluetooth um, uh, Smart um, have all uh, been deploying products for many years. Unfortunately, they're not on the internet, they're not part of IoT, but they've been upgrading their protocols to support um, IPv6 and to effectively become part of the Internet of Things. Um, so measurement could be added as part of that um, to these um, software uh, stacks. Another problem here is that almost the, the millions and millions of devices in the field that use uh, these protocols today are not software are not software updatable, so they would not be able to benefit from the newer versions, which could also take many years to be adopted and deployed in the field, just like with Onjon and IoTVT. And then there is um, the increasingly uh, prevalent use of um, of uh, operating systems coming from the mobile uh, space, um, uh, uh, Android and Windows and OpenWRT being the dominant ones, that could also be extended to enable measurement and to and to produce usage and pro to produce um, usage data that could be used in this field. Another aspect of measurement is that, um, unlike what a lot of people tend to think. Even though these, these devices will be uh, on the internet, they will not be directly on the open internet. A lot of them will reside behind what's called edge networks. They will be behind uh, routers, typically in, in the home, and these routers won't be there because most of the devices need to talk directly to each other and not um, and not go to to a cloud and back, which uh, creates which has a highly uh, which, which creates a significant latencies. We don't want, for example, to have a five second delay to turn on a, uh, the, the lights when you press a, a light button in your house. You want to press a light button, you want the light button to talk directly to the light switch over the local network and in, in mi microseconds turn the light on. Same thing with your door lock and, 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 and pretty much everything in your house. So the majority of uh, connected home devices will uh, talk to each other directly on a local peer-to-peer -peer network going through a, a home router of some sort. The home router will also um, Reduce uh, uh, the cloud dependencies. Um, and w one example of why this is important is with the Revolve service. Revolve was a um, a, um, a home automation startup that uh, Nest bought uh, last year, and which they shut down uh, about three weeks ago, three four weeks ago. Uh, effectively uh, turning off the cloud service, and all the customers uh, who had bought these systems uh, ended up with bricks. Nothing worked anymore because none of the uh, of their devices, from uh, from uh, motion sensors to, to to cameras to door locks to to light switches, uh, um, had uh, required to connect to to a cloud service to function. And when a cloud service went down, nothing worked anymore. 
So uh, we, we can have that in the future and increasingly we'll see manufacturers uh, create systems that can work on the local internet, on the edge network and have very little dependency on the, on, on the, on the cloud service so that um, if it goes down for any reason things still work. And this is also important from the point of view of security and privacy which has been risen, which has been uh, rising in the minds of consumers because if you keep data local, if very little data is out on the internet, then the, the risk of breaches and uh, intrusions and um, and security breaches are, 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 are much reduced. So one good candidate for doing this is uh, the OpenWRT stack, which is used in, uh, in a, almost all of the IoT gateways being developed today and in a large number of, um, of home routers from Linksys and many others. And uh, that's how it's, fortunately it's an open source framework, so it's easy to make uh, contributions to it and extend it with measurements. So that's one area that, uh, that, sh that should be looked at. Another area is, um, is home automation services. So today you can go and buy, um, for example, a, a, a Wink um, hub, like the one on the left, that talks many different protocols and uh, enables you to create uh, rules to automate uh, functions in your house. So for example, when you open your, your front door, you could automatically turn on lights in your living room or, um, uh, or uh, lower the blinds. Um, in your bedroom or that kind of things. So you can, you can automate functions across different brands of devices and that's really nice. Um, another one that does that without a piece of hardware is the IFT service, the web-based service, which integrates with many uh, web-based services but also many um, smart home devices like, like Nest and, um, and August and, and um, that, uh, to, to, to able, be able to uh, create web-based rules. So these guys produce a lot of data that could also be uh, considered uh, usage data because home automation and usage data really have very similar uh, requirements. That's one place where measurement could be um, enabled and the, the, this, red, the, this kind of data be extracted in a, in a very useful manner. So once we get the uh, data, so assuming we can now get the data from all different brands of devices and get it all in one place, how do we make sense of that? Well, one problem that uh, we're going to have is that the data needs, needs to have the same meaning. So, for example, if uh, one um, brand of refrigerator sends a, um, a message to indicate that the freezer door is open, uh, a different brand might send a completely different message. It could say, for example, the, the temperature in my freezer is dropping fast right now, which could be a side effect of being, leaving the freezer door open. So we need a guarantee that the different uh, uh, that devices from, from different manufacturers will send the same messages and these messages will mean the same thing. And that's why we call, that's why we, we, we think uh, a common data taxonomy would be critical for this. We need to have a way to, to describe what devices do in a way that's uniform across the board. And the ideal way to doing that would be through some sort of common standard. In fact, this data standard would be even more important than application standards. It doesn't matter if uh, we have 50 different uh, application platforms and 50 different set of APIs to get uh, to, 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 for these devices to, to, um, uh, to operate. What's really, uh, what's really important is that these devices generate the same type of data and they mean the same thing. So, so we can extract uh, meaning from them and, and uh, both automate them and, uh, and, and measure uh, 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 consumers on, on based on what they do. So it turns out that there is an effort um, already in progress uh, doing exactly this. It's part of the OASIS um, open community and it's called COEL for classification of everyday living. And what these guys are, have been doing in the last two years is they've created about they've pretty much they, they've created a hierarchy a classification of everything that you as a person can be doing in any given day from uh, driving a car, brushing your teeth, um, eating lunch, I mean everything. It's about 5,000 events right now. It's obviously still much too small to represent every uh, little subtlety of every uh, 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 of every consumer device you could be using, but if this is extended, we could eventually end up with something that could be used across the board by all manufacturers and could produce this data that we need um, uh, for measurement. Then um, the final um, uh, thought on this is that um, these devices not only need to to report what they're doing, but who is using them. And that's a really big problem uh, with IoT. And it's a problem we, are, we have also with, with cable set-top boxes and with smart TVs. 
these are devices that um, that um, don't have cookies, don't have user IDs. Basically, people they share devices. It's not like your uh, PC. It's not like a mobile phone or a tablet where you log in and you, uh, you identify yourself when when you use them. These are not personal devices. This is something that is in your house or in a public place and that a lot of people will use at different times. And uh, who is using them uh, as, uh, is very important because it's, it's, it's going to create context about a different person and it could also change usage uh, dramatically. So it, it's, if, if you want to be able to extract value for the data, especially for, for advertisers, um, we need to be able to assign demographics to, 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 to this usage. And it turns out that Nielsen, we've been working on a solution for this called the Nielsen Census Methodology for quite a while. Um, the way it works is that, um, uh, sorry, uh, it integrates data from um, both panels and, um, and census sources. And uh, uh, we, we, we use um, uh, census-based um, demographic data partners that give us aggregated demographics for the data sets we receive, uh, in particular uh, Facebook and Experian. And uh, we, uh, we are able to assign demographics to the data sets, we calibrate them with our panels, and we use them in a number of products uh, for measuring the Nielsen, what we call Nielsen total audience. So that's used, for our, uh, that's used today already on, uh, on, on PCs, on mobile, and on tablets. It's also used on the buy side, uh, for example, for, 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 for shopping. And the same method could be used for um, measuring the Internet of Things and creating demographics for the Internet of Things. So this way, the way this would work is we start by collecting census usage data. Then we uh, add on top of that what we call an IoT device graph. An IoT device graph is, um, is a way to, um, to assign multiple devices that uh, belong to the same uh, household, um, to, to the same household effectively. So uh, we look at things like IP address and location and other um, methods to say this TV and this coffee machine and this mobile phone and this PC are all part of the same household. So all, they all become to the, to the same, people, to the same uh, group of known people. And then uh, Facebook and Experian and other demographic data partners can tell us the demographic uh, characteristics of some of the devices, so the device graphs the device graph lets us um, assign these demographics to devices that we don't know the demographics for. So now we can say this door lock or this uh, coffee machine has the same users as this uh, mobile device and as this PC and as this TV, for example. And then uh, because the demographics we get from these uh, partners tend to be skewed towards very specific demographics, we use our panels for calibration so we can include the whole U.S. population, including uh, uh, People that might not be on the internet, like like uh, children under 13 or or, we, or 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 senior citizens, and we use that to produce what we call the ground, the the source of truth uh, demographics. So today we do that for for PC, mobile, and uh, tablets, and the same thing could be done for IoT using this this, method, this uh, census uh, methodology. So uh, this is pretty much. We're reaching the end of my presentation, and um, from today, I'd like just to summarize a few key takeaways. The first is that uh, third-party measurement solutions will be key to bring consumer IoT into the mainstream. This will uh, require the creation of new IoT consumer segments suitable for advertising and other purposes, which could result potentially in lower consumer prices. This will be based on collecting usage data instead of telemetry from the end to end field with a common data taxonomy, which will, be an essential, which will be an essential part of the solution. And measurement should be added to um, standard software frameworks using consumer devices and IoT gateways. And the segments will also need IoT demographics, such as those can, can be produced by the Nielsen Census methodology. So if you'd like to know more about this, I encourage you to, um, to look for uh, my article in the Nielsen Journal of Measurement, which will be published in before the end of this month on the Nielsen uh, website. And um, if you have any questions, um, I think we have enough, we have a few minutes left. Yes, actually we do. Thank you so uh, much, JP. That was really, really um, great, um, really fascinating because I feel like we've all 
um, been in the marketplace in the last few years. We're all aware of it. We're all aware of things, connected devices, smart devices. Um, and we're probably, most of us has, have been around the circles long enough to see, um, talk about the Internet of Things and everything like that. Um, guys, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to answer them in the questions box, and I will ask uh, JP those questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, I, I actually have a question myself, um, JP, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about standardization, and what came to mind for me was the whole HD, DVD, and Blu-ray uh, standardization. And that was actually that's something that held back the, yeah. the, the, the actual adoption of, of anything high definition at all, because people were waiting for that to get decided. Now that's obviously was deciding between two different types of standards. Is there anything, any takeaways from from that, uh, you know, that occurrence or or, or that time that that could, that could help get some standardization here? Because that seems like a major barrier for people. Is if, and it's also it's also probably something that's keeping prices high as well, uh, up as well, right? I mean, not being able to go to somewhere else for a cheaper price because you have to stay with the standard that you're using seems to be uh, it. It seems to be a multiple a source of multiple problems. Is there any, is there any parallels there? Is there any solutions available there with the whole HD DVD thing? So you're absolutely right. The battle between Blu-ray and HD DVD caused, uh, first of all, consumers to hold back from buying into the standards before they were, um, before the battle, before who won the battle was clear, because they still remembered the, the, the situation with Betamax and the VHS. Right. So we want a repeat of that. And also uh, that delayed uh, these products uh, from coming to market long enough that uh, effectively they missed their window of opportunity and uh, online streaming services took over instead. So now people don't uh, don't want uh, don't, don't need a, uh, um, a Blu-ray uh, player anymore. We can just go to Netflix directly or watch online, and it's much more convenient. So so it they really hurt themselves more <laughs> more than anything yeah. else by doing that. And the same thing is happening in the uh, consumer IoT space. Uh, we have a situation where all of the players want to market all to themselves, including the, the big names like Google and, 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 and Apple yeah. and, and, and Amazon, and uh, they're hoping they can be dominant in this space, and they haven't decided to give up yet, and it's holding back consumers again, same thing. But it's much more complex this time around because it's not just a battle between two formats. We have, we're also having major privacy issues, major cost issues, Major, major uh, basic technology issues, like I mentioned, the the, the issue of changing batteries on, on yeah, these devices, I mean, and also it's not the same internet as the one we 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 we've lived with in the first the first two ways of the internet. It's, it, these devices have a very low; uh, they need to work it's function on very low power. They have very low connectivity, so it's tough. It's often um, um, uh, it's often um, Occasional, we're not connected all the time on internet. So, uh, new versions of the uh, basic internet protocols um, are being replaced with highly compressed versions of these protocols that optimize for these devices. Right. These protocols are so new that almost nobody is using them yet. Yeah. So, I mean, we are in the we are in the first inning of this game. You know, we yeah. the, the, the basic building blocks are just being built, and nobody is using them yet. And we still miss we're still missing many many of them. So, it's it's much more than just a battle of standards at this point. Right. Well, hopefully there'll be solutions coming forward. I, I feel like what happened with the with the with the Blu-ray versus HD DVD thing was was studios or or dist, uh, distributors of of different types of content like videos and stuff got together and they decided on a on a on a on a, on a, um, a format because they were hurting themselves um, by either doing both or or not picking one. I don't know who would be the equivalent players here that would allow that sort of solution to come forth. Do you have any idea so of the big, risk, the, the big risk today is that, um, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of open source standards being developed, and they right. do realize there's too much fragmentation, and they are starting to work with each other. Okay. The big issue right now is that they completely rely on their members' contributions for advancing the, the standard. Right. And if there's too many of them, the members don't have the resources to, 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 to write code and advance the, the, the platforms in 50 of them. We can only maybe focus on one or two, and it's just moving slower. By having 50 of them, progress is moving forward 50 times slower. And then at, at, in the same time, you have companies like Google and Apple that are able to, uh, to focus all of their energy, and they have a lot more resources, into developing their own um, platforms. 
and they can move at 10 times, 100 times the speed, and they could, they, they could catch on and, and ship products much faster than these open source standards. So that there is a risk we might end up with a closed internet in, the, in, in this third phase. It's not going to be the open internet of uh, phase one or the semi-open of phase two. It might end up being completely closed, and that would be terrible for, uh, for consumers uh, right. at the end. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I, uh, I'm not seeing any questions um, um, here, but I do have one more if you have time. Um, you talked about security concerns and people's security concerns, and then you go on to talk about using data from people for measurement and for, and for things like that. Can you illuminate for people the different types of concern, security concerns people have and the difference between people's security concerns for having their data stolen or hacked by people, bad actors, by people um, who want to use this for Ellen, for people who, like Nielsen, who want to use this sort of data to, um, because to, to the uninitiated, that may seem like the same thing, right? It's like, uh, who, who cares who has my data that I don't want them to have? It's, um, it's, all, it's all a security concern to me. So uh, there's, there's, lots of different, there's a lot of different types of data. Not all data is created equal. Um, the data that um, so the consumers are concerned about PII, you know, personally, identifi personally identifiable information. information that could be used for basically uh, hacking into your bank account or uh, right. unlocking your front door and doing things that would have very dramatic negative consequences. Uh, some could be even some could even be uh, life-threatening, like taking control of your self-driving car. Right. Um, so that's uh, that's something that's very very scary, and it's going to hold back uh, consumers, I think, for a long time from adopting technologies that will be otherwise very mature. So we need to solve that problem, and it's probably the number one most discussed topic at all of the various events that I've been um, going to. It's even more important than standards in fact. Um, at Nielsen, uh, we only are interested in a subset of the type of data. We, we want to know what, what people are doing with them. We don't want control. We don't want to be able to unlock your front door. We just don't want to know that it's been open at a, at a certain time, and we'd like to be able to, to figure out what kind of people went through your front door and uh, what they were doing after that, or making coffee, or doing laundry, or that type of things. That, type of things. that is data that, we, that only us would get. We're not sure we have any partners, and we would use that for, for, for basically uh, producing consumer segments and improving our, our, our ratings products. So um, I think uh, in that scenario, that type of, of usage data is something that should be under the control of consumers and they should be able to decide who gets it and, and, uh, what, and, 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 and for what purpose it, it will be used. Right. So I think we're going to need to, uh, in this, that's why I think there's a, today there's a huge gap in, in, in this uh, sector. We need to be able to create standards and policies around data. We have a, a, a data standards that clearly segment data for its different users and who controls it and uh, who can get it. And um, there's a lack of transparency today. Today, data is one big log file. And the uh, manufacturers, are, manufacturers just hoard the data in big servers. They don't know what to do with it. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's, un, it's unstructured data. We need to have more structured data. and. Uh, the way to, to do that is to, is, 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 I think, is through the various standards. So we all produce the same type of data. We use the same data taxonomies and uh -huh. the segment data uh, in different ways. So telemetry definitely should go back to the manufacturers, it's their data. We want to know if the device is, is broken. It's working. Um, but uh, how the device is being used, that should be really owned by the consumer. And they should be able to decide that only gets it, you know, right. and uh, not somebody that they don't trust. So it sounds like the security Con the security concerns here is about two types of control. A, the type of actually control, which is the obvious threat of, of actually someone being able to control your devices, such as your doors and your cars and things like that. And then B, the other type of control that matters here is consumers being able to decide who gets their data, even if it's just for ad purposes or for things like that. Consumers being able to decide whether or not they're, they're, they're participating in that. And so that's something that um, is the major difference between what what Nielsen wants to do here with the with IoT and what somebody who is um, a hacker or somebody who is wanting to do something ill there. And so there is that distinction, but maybe people who aren't really aware of, of a lot of this may not be able to hear the difference, but there's, those are big, big differences. Those two levels of control um, are very big, big, big differences there um, and very important. 
But um, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything else to add or, or anything, any way that people could reach you or, or anything like that? Um, sh sure. You're welcome to, to reach me at uh, my email address at uh, Nielsen, jp.abello at nielsen.com. Great. Just like my name. And um, I invite you to look at uh, the Nielsen Journal of Measurement on the Nielsen homepage. It should be out in, in the next couple of weeks. And all of this is covered in much more detail in a 12-page in um, uh, article on, on, uh, on IoT. Excellent. Thank you, JP. We will be sure to, uh, to check that out. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, and thank everybody for um, um, joining us for Out of Home Office Hours. Please join us in the future. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.